estava eu a dizer que gostava de cumprimentar os, os alunos de todas as unidades curriculares e os professores que estão presentes, as outras pessoas que também nos estão a assistir via a transmissão uh, YouTube. Um, e antes de passar ao meu colega, ao professor Eliseu Gonçalves, que irá fazer a apresentação do Daniel Bárbara, que eu cumprimento especial, especialmente uh, a enorme simpatia com que se deu a participar nesta conferência, uh, queria dizer uh, que para a realização desta conferência ela integra o programa curricular da teoria 2 do Programa de Doutoramento de Arquitetura da Faculdade de Arquitetura da Universidade do Porto e também da Unidade Curricular de Arquitetura, Energia e Clima do Mestrado Integrado de Arquitetura, também da Faculdade de Arquitetura da Universidade do Porto. Conta ainda com o apoio do Centro de Estudos de Arquitetura e Urbanismo da Faculdade de Arquitetura e, obviamente, julgo que o título da conferência, Arquitetura Before and After Air Conditioning, é por si esclarecedor da situação em que nos encontramos. Eu, desde já, agradeço ao Daniel e a passar também a palavra ao Eliseu Gonçalves. Muito, muito obrigado. Boa, boa tarde também a todos. <coughs> obrigado pela presença. E também queria deixar aqui um agradecimento particular a, aos estudantes das Unidades Curriculares de Teoria 2 de PDA e também da Arquitetura, Arquitetura Energia e Clima do, do MIAR que aqui presentes. Eu irei fazer então uma breve apresentação, eh, prometo não ser, ser muito curto. A conferência intitulada Architecture Before and After Air Conditioning será preferida pelo professor Daniel Barber, como bem sabe. Daniel Barber é professor de arquitetura na Universidade da Pensilvânia, na Stuart Weitzman School of Design, é doutorado em História e Teoria da Arquitetura pela Columbia University e mestre em Environment Design por Yale. Também desenvolveu investigação de pós-doutoramento na Harvard University Center for Environment and Graduate School of Design, é ainda professor visitante em diversas universidades, nomeadamente no Environment Institute da Princeton School of Architecture, e tem dado diversas conferências em várias geografias e também em diversos contextos. O seu currículo é vasto, vou só aqui sublinhar um, um ou dois aspectos. É dominado por uma investigação ancorada na relação entre o campo disciplinar da arquitetura e a emergência da cultura ambiental durante o século XX uh, e, e, e que podemos transportar também para, para o século XXI. Aquelas vão ser para aqui, é? A investigação que tem vindo a desenvolver permite uma releitura do modernismo entre as preocupações ambientais de práticas esquecidas pela história. Isto é um aspecto fundamental na sua obra, mas simultaneamente fornece uma estrutura teórica disciplinar pertinente no atual quadro de crise climática. Em 2016, ano em que eu tive o primeiro contacto com a produção de Daniel Barber, exatamente através do, do, do livro que nesse ano publicou, A House in the Sun, Modern Architecture and Solar Energy in the Cold War, publicado pela Oxford University Press, Onde, onde conseguimos, a partir da sua leitura, construir novas perspectivas sobre a produção arquitetónica moderna, focada, obviamente, na questão americana e a partir de fontes documentais originais. No seu livro mais recente, Modern Architecture and Climate, Design Before Air Conditioning, que é exatamente, foi lançado ano passado pela Princeton University Press, Barber verifica como as estratégias de mediação para uma adaptabilidade climática usadas por alguns arquitetos de referência do pós-guerra foram essenciais para o desenvolvimento e emancipação da arquitetura. Quando há meio ano contratamos o Daniel Barber para dar uma conferência, havia ainda uma forte expectativa de, de ela poder ser presencial aqui no auditório da FAP. Infelizmente, a situação pandémica, como bem sabem, ainda não o permite 
e, e é por isso que estamos ainda nesta situação do, da videoconferência. Mas estamos em crer que as novas perspectivas que o professor Daniel Weber deixará aqui sobre a relação entre a arquitetura e ambiente superará qualquer debilidade que uma videoconferência possa conter. Eu tentei falar pausadamente porque eu sei que o Daniel Weber percebe um pouco de português e, e a conferência durará cerca de 45 minutos, o que permitirá logo a seguir um pequeno debate a partir de questões colocadas por quem o desejar. Um, dear Professor Daniel, thank you for accepting our invitation. It is a great pleasure that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the Faculty of Architecture of Oporto welcomes you. The word is yours. I give you a floor. Muito obrigado, Eliseu. Boa tarde a todos. I, I apologize for not being able to present uh, in Portuguese. Um, I, I wish that that would have been uh, more, more reasonable for me, but um, I'm hoping we can uh, I very much appreciate the introductions and discussions uh, of the work and, and uh, look forward to uh, uh, presenting some of my uh, latest research and, and of course, um, hearing some questions and, uh, at the end. So thank you to both to Rui and, and Eliseo for this uh, invitation. And again, it's, it's really a pleasure to have the chance to speak with you all today. I'm gonna to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Okay, just to, if I can get a thumbs up from someone that that's working, yes? Looks good, yeah? Okay. Okay, so I wanna do a, a few different things um, this evening together. Um, uh, to, to talk uh, a little bit about my, my recent book, as was mentioned, uh, Modern Architecture and Climate, uh, but to do so in such a way that I, I hope kind of opens up a broader set of questions and discussions, um, uh, discussions about climate and architecture and their consequences and their resonance, their interactions, to do so in a sense as a, as a way of rethinking, uh, at least for me, uh, uh, as an opportunity to reimagine the contours of architectural history and its potential significance. So a sort of bigger picture then, uh, humbly uh, uh, submitting to, to open up a bigger picture around how we are thinking about architecture and its relationship to systems, social systems, mechanical systems, and again, how we are thinking about the future the kinds of possibilities, the opportunities and challenges that the field of architecture is engaging. What is at stake, in other words, in particular, for telling new histories of architecture? What sort of narratives and themes begin to emerge? What sort of concerns, be they around race and equity, around gender parity and representation, around decolonization, how all of these issues have begun to reframe the field through its history and impacting its commitments? So I wanna do this today to give us a chance, I hope to think a little bit together about how climate, um, which is to say the entanglement of carbon dioxide emissions, uh, the disruptions to the geophysical system and the relationship of those two issues, right? Of, of the emissions of climate and its kind of effects on the world around us uh, are related in fact, quite directly to the designed provision of thermal comfort often through the mechanism of air conditioning and how this entanglement sort of opens up, pries open again, some, some possible discussions in the field. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm sort of playing out this preamble for a second um, uh, for a few reasons uh, as we're uh, coming uh, together to discuss issues sort of foundational to our collective uh, disciplinary projects. Now, to sort of think through, um, uh, which is to say a, a slightly outside perspective, right? To kind of look into architecture uh, beyond some of our familiar understandings of it, beyond some of our familiar notions to try to challenge some of the histories that we've come to accept, appreciate, even adore uh, in order to, to, to kind of think through other possibilities, right? And one of those possibilities again, uh, certainly is this question of air conditioning, right? So an issue that I've long been obsessed with, as we'll see uh, at, at some length, 
um, and as a sort of diagram, right, of, of some of these schemas and possibilities, an issue that has largely been left out of architectural discussions, right? And of course, we can talk in, in the Q&A about the, the kind of unevenness with which air conditioning has been applied in the North American and European and uh, not to mention African and Indian subcontinent and Australasian contexts. Uh, it's not, it's certainly not a, a question of air conditioning sort of taking over the world, yet its effects nonetheless by virtue of carbon dioxide emissions have had a, a planetary context. Um, so I've been interested in how air conditioning has both been essential to the architecture of the 20th and into the 21st century, but has often been left out of our discussions, whether that's being uh, sort of sent over to the engineering consultants or simply uh, hidden in drop ceilings as, as at Rem Kulhas's Elements exhibition at the Venice Biennale in 2015 is thematizing here. Air conditioning is an aspect of buildings that generally speaking architects assume will be there, right? They presume it is needed, embed it almost without considering it, often indeed leaving the details to others. Although this is of course also something that's changing quite dramatically, right? And so I'm rehearsing this a moment and sort of elaborating this preamble for a second, um, in part to suggest or to just sort of get us in a, in a kind of state of mind, if you will, um, uh, to suggest that as many others are also suggesting in different ways. And I draw one prominent example here, um, uh, this, this amazing book edited by Harriet Harris and Rory Hyde and Roberta Marcaccio um, suggests that architecture as a discipline, as a profession, as an engine of cultural expression is struggling to make a substantive transition, right? away from, let's call it the star system, right? Away from a sort of adoration of a certain kind of talent, from the uh, emulation of some sort of ineffable emergence of genius, away from a celebrations of terms and values internal or autonomous to the field, our sort of internal architectural discussions, and towards a different sort of engagement with respect for and humility relative to the broader social world world of relations more than objects, a world that, and this is kind of an essential point, a world that architecture and perhaps even architectural history is well prepared to engage, right? So this notion that architecture is finding itself incredibly valuable to the world as we face uh, these climate challenges that we all know so well, um, yet we're struggling a bit as a discipline on cultural terms, on ideological terms, uh, to think through the best response to some of these problems. So it's to say that architecture is a discipline and a profession, and here no different from numerous other fields of inquiry or uh, uh, cultural agents that are caught up in climate disruptions, right? Um, uh, that architecture is collectively sort of poised to become something else, right? To continue to participate in this transversal project of imagining and reimagining our collective future uh, in spite of, or in, as means to overcome some of those obstacles in the way. Okay, so I'm gonna be getting to, um, you know, the sort of uh, architectural histories themselves in just a moment, but I, I wanna sort of, uh, again, continue to set the stage here for, for one more second, uh, thinking again about these responsibilities of the field as we encounter these transitions. What sorts of histories, architectures, theories, and concepts become activated in the context of this cultural struggle to open up architecture in schools and in, prof in the profession and texts and lectures on the streets, to open up the design of the built environment to different inputs, to changed expectations, to long overlooked perspectives. How can historical accounts of the field, which have also been, or at least some of them, caught up in these same sort of adorations and star systems, right? Rehearsals of mastery and talent, how do new narratives provide access to and intensify the potential of the design fields, now speaking very broadly, to play out a rich and effective engagement with the challenges that we face as a broader global society, be they the challenges of a pandemic, the ongoing challenge of the climate emergency, or the ongoing complications of, of racial and social injustice. So as an architectural historian, right, this is to some extent my task or the one that I'll take on and talk through a bit today, how to draw attention to a different timeline, a different series of events with a different kind of relevance, to stage an encounter with some of these histories and ideas and architectures 
uh, many of which you'll probably recognize, um, historical patterns that we think we know, right, but that we're now starting to see a little differently. And indeed, uh, directly at this nexus of architecture and climate, of thermal comfort and air conditioning, a set of issues and concerns whose relevance to our present and near future is beginning to shift, right? To opera, offer up some new forms of relevance. So following here, Isabel Stanger's in this quote that I've left up for a minute because it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a difficult uh, uh, rhetorical position to take, uh, following Isabel Stanger's and her call for a second history, right? one that encourages, encourages us to focus on a different set of events, right? Indicating here that every event will bring the future that will inherit from it into communication with the past narrated differently. That's to say a different set of histories that allow for a different set of futures to possibly emerge. So following Stanger's and examining the broad contours of the architectural past to reimagine our conceptions of modernism and modernity, of uh, architecture and its future, to sort of rescript some of these narratives now with, with these other possible futures in mind. Okay, so again, this sort of broad uh, preamble is a means to, uh, to sort of uh, think through, I hope, to sort of get us into this state of mind that helps us to think about other possible perspectives on these histories. Um, uh, to give myself permission as well, to give us all here permission uh, to some extent, uh, certainly in the Q&A, uh, to say some things that might not normally sort of make sense according to some of these received histories that disrupt them, uh, not only in order to suggest that other buildings matter, right, that other sorts of evidence can become clear, but that by uh, respectfully uh, questioning and interrogating some of these other histories and rescripting them, um, uh, we can begin to reconsider their relevance, to move around them, if not past them, to offer other narratives and different contours and consequences focused on a different kind of story of architecture. Again, one that doesn't necessarily completely add up relative to the approaches uh, that, we've, that we've been accustomed to, but that might make some sense uh, when we sort of imagine and perceive the prospects for an architecture appropriate to the challenges of the near future. We'll return to these images in a minute, but I, I just wanna start by following my own uh, sort of permission structure here that I've just offered and, and say something that might initially sound a little uh, crazy, right? Or a little distinct from the narratives that we know, and, and which is that uh, start by saying that climate, right? And the role of architecture as an interface between the experience of the interior, its temperature and humidity, its relative comfort, what we could call the thermal interior, that architecture's historical significance, or at least a large part of it, is as an interface between the thermal interior, the conditions on the inside, as we see in this room, and the global climate, That's, which is to say in the details and some of the precise mapping of how a facade relates to the diurnal and seasonal climate patterns in which it finds itself. So we'll see some more examples of this in a moment, but just to begin to uh, construct a conception of architecture, right? That sees this sort of facade condition and the way in which it treats, uh, building treats its internal uh, thermal environment as an important aspect of its uh, set of future consequences. That envelopes uh, hold culture in, right? From overexposure to the natural world, they modulate this climatic metabolism at the same time that they represent cultural investments in a specific relationship between interior and exterior climate. So what I'm trying to pose with this first sort of example, and, and I'll play it out again, uh, kind of reiterate it in one second, um, uh, trying to pose that, that uh, in, in kind of thinking about the inside and the outside, the thermal interior and the global climate, that all architectures are climatic, right? All architectures sort of enact a relationship between the interior and the exterior. Uh, they, in, do, in so doing, they're also producing our future, our collective future for better or worse. So this building, the Equitable Insurance Building in Portland, Oregon, designed by Pietro Belushki and completed in 1947, will serve as something of a foil, as a sort of inverse of the dis sort of discussion that I want to focus on today. Uh, the building is generally regarded as the first to be built with a fully sealed glass curtain wall, right? Uh, thereby requiring an extensive heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system on the interior. We can 
see some evidence here in the heat registers, right? So these windows do not open, right? Um, the building used a reverse cycle heat pump system that relied on groundwater for heating and cooling space. So it wasn't precisely fossil fuel driven. Uh, it responded to the imperative of full employment after World War II by capitalizing on the abundance of cheap energy uh, in the Columbia River Valley, a river that flows just north of Portland, Oregon, as some of you might know. Uh, so this was relatively cheap, relatively non-polluting hydropower, uh, cheap, I should say, in terms of economics, not necessarily in terms of ecosystemic uh, impact. Uh, in discussing an early version of this scheme, the architect of the project, Belushki, wrote, quote, our assumptions were affected by the peculiar circumstances of the Northwest region, the region in which he was building, cheap power and a tremendously expanded production of light metals for war use which beg for utilization after the emergency, end quote. So this notion that by virtue of expanding production during the war, hydropower had become more available to the region in which he was building, and that had produced an opportunity and by which he could continue to use that same power to extend, as he put it, uh, that emergency condition into the future uh, by producing a building that required as much energy as possible in effect, right? Uh, so it aspired to use that energy in order to encourage to continue to operate quite literally in this state of emergency, right, that wartime production had instigated. And it's an important emblem for us, I think, in that it kind of sets up uh, a kind of beginning, right, a kind of beginning moment, although we'll go a little further back, um, a beginning moment that suggests that this sort of conditions of air-conditioned modernity are also sort of conditions of an emergency, right? And if that's the beginning, this is a building here is hopefully perhaps one of the ends. Uh, air conditioning, the energy it uses, the strain it has placed on our global economic system, the inequities it engenders and the elitism it solidifies can be seen in some ways as continuing, right? The state of emergency of the wartime period uh, that Belushki was describing, complicating the conditions of life and prospects for the future. So again, if the equitable tower we just saw sits at the beginning of this air conditioned world, these so-called pencil towers recently emerging in Manhattan uh, might uh, uh, predicate something of an end. This one in particular, uh, 432 Park designed by Raphael Vignoli, um, um, as we see here in a kind of glamorous version and then, and then here in a slightly bleaker one, uh, just by virtue of, of a lot of kind of camera angles and Photoshop, right? Um, uh, uh, but this, this one of these super talls as we're seeing here takes advantage of a loophole and you can see, uh, you can see here um, uh, in these little gaps, right? Uh, in the building itself. Um, uh, those are floors that are added to, that are where mechanical systems occupy those floors. Those are not living areas, right? So in effect, the, uh, the designers of these super talls have uh, discovered a loophole in the, um, in the coding system, the building codes of Manhattan, wherein mechanical systems are not counted for floor height. So you can add as much air conditioning as you want, and it will uh, extend the height of the building and allow them to be the tallest one on the on the cityscape, right? So uh, uh, clarifying in a way, or sort of an emblem of the sort of feedback structure uh, of economic life that we're still kind of trying to manage, right? How these kind of conditions for increased prosperity are also uh, producing quite damaging effects uh, on the world that surrounds it. So what I wanna do now uh, to sort of jump in, in effect to the heart of the matter, uh, having described or, or sort of set myself up a bit to, to say some perhaps slightly crazy things to disrupt some received knowledge is to look, um, to look at a few episodes at a few events in the history of modern architecture that interrogate both this question of modern and architecture, right? And in effect sort of reframe the field um, uh, to reimagine the techno-cultural apparatus that design and to some extent our built environment, its capacity to produce buildings, to reimagine architecture quite literally as a device for climatic adaptability, right? And to frame it according to a narrative that suggests that architecture became modern and became climatic simultaneously. And indeed the emergence of the ideas and ambitions we often associate with architectural modernism were in fact supported by, founded on, developed through entanglements with and attempts to use buildings as devices for managing the vagaries of climate for better or worse. 
Okay, so I'm now gonna dive into a few examples and um, uh, to start to give you some sense of, of what I mean. And then we can sort of zoom back out and consider some of these consequences and resonances of, of what I see as a kind of epical historiographic shift. So we'll start the story in, in Brazil, in, in Rio, and you'll forgive me for my anglicization of some of these terms that I, I, I know that you know well in, in Portuguese. Uh, at this building, the Instituto do Reseguros do Brasil, the Brazilian Reinsurance Agency, uh, another insurance building, right? We already saw uh, equitable insurance is kind of providing a certain type of interior space uh, appropriate to a certain uh, condition of modernity. What better site, in fact, than uh, than uh, one focused on insurance to consider the contours of architecture and modernity in the context that is of a building constructed to manage risk or really to sort of meta-manage, meta right? The risks of capital investments, reinsuring as was going on here, reinsuring insurers and corporations anxious to join in the industrialization, the so-called modernization, certainly the capitalization of the Brazilian territory a saga that plays out in different ways across the so-called developing economies, even today, of the global south, and this explicit means of inserting, exporting a set of economic systems through insurance, through capital investments, a set of social expectations of buildings, here again, of modern architectures, as a kind of interventionary mechanism, right? So a kind of framing of these buildings, as we'll see, as a kind of interventionary mechanism, expanding the scope and increasing the velocity of the flow of capital, expanding the territory in effect of the global. The IRB, as this building was often called, commissioned by the government and designed and built in Rio in 1942 by the Roberto brothers, uh, two of whom had been trained by Lucio Costa. Uh, the building had an elaborate set of shading mechanisms. It was carefully designed for dynamic interaction with its climate. The different facades had different treatments, as we see here, according to their solar exposure. The north, which is, of course, the sun-facing facade in the southern hemisphere, uh, seen here on the left, had alternating banks of fixed, uh, fixed shading louvers with two vertical circulation systems faced with glass brick. The south and east facades consisted largely of horizontal bands of carefully placed fenestration, and we'll look back to them in, in a few minutes. We can also glimpse in this kind of zoom in to that image of the North facade under construction, uh, precisely the kind of still in construction nature of the surroundings uh, in 1941, evidence uh, this sort of emergence, right, of a certain kind of flow of capital that will animate our discussion uh, uh, this evening. The importance of climate as an aspect of an architecture focused on economic development. This building again, government funded, to house reinsurance agents such as Lloyd and Swiss Re, explicitly a means to encourage and facilitate development in this industrializing country. The North facade consisted of two layers. The first, as we can see in the section, that was about two thirds glazing, right? So I'm first looking kind of right in here, this smaller image, uh, the about two thirds glazing. The second exterior layer was of fixed louvers, which we see on the left. The fixed panels, we should note, hung at a slight distance. Uh, the second skin was in fact prefabricated uh, and attached on site. The reinforced uh, concrete, sorry, the reinforced concrete louvers were formed in shallow, shallow and plan. Again, I'm kind of reading through this plan here. Uh, the outer face of the louver was a heat deflecting surface as the diagram indicates uh, to block the penetrating rays of the summer sun while the interface was light reflecting in order to increase the daylight transmitted to the interior. There was also a heat dispersion space, right? A kind of a buffer zone here that was also had a ventilating system as we can see through these operable louvers on top to allow that heat gathered within that kind of tight cement uh, uh, louver condition to um, uh, be ventilated up, uh, 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 and out of the building. We can see some of the effects of this system Oops, um, on the interior uh, in period photographs, uh, right, from the time, little direct solar pen penetration, uh, but perhaps quite light. I mean, it's difficult to tell relative to questions around exposure, et cetera. Um, uh, these aspects were intensified by the use of open office space, glass brick, glass brick walls, and other transparent partitions, and the use, the, the sort of moving of filing systems to the periphery. This early attempt 
to align a building with its regional climate, however much we may be able today to identify its various misapprehensions, was the avant-garde of its moment, right? A moment when the Brazilian government under the so-called benevolent dictatorship of Getulio Vargas was undergoing rapid industrialization and economic development. Again, the building as housing reinsurance agencies to sort of smooth the flow of capital. And I think we can kind of imagine the clickety clacketing right of all of the processing systems and typewriters and calculators going on within these, uh, within these various workspaces, uh, kind of reimagining the, uh, the capacity of capital to reimagine, I should say, the hinterland of the Brazilian um, um, countryside. The historian and curator Barry Bergdahl uh, wrote in reference uh, to his uh, quite amazing exhibition from 2015 at the Museum of Modern Art called Latin America Under Construction. Uh, Bergdahl wrote that the emergence of a distinctly South American modernism involved projects and buildings that quote, are not belated reflections of examples set in Europe, but pre-visions of a modernization to come, end quote. Bergdahl's intervention sort of helps me out here today, uh, indicating that Brazil was not, uh, that Brazil was a site of emergence, right, of production, uh, more than a site for reception of modern architectural ideas. The arrow of history here, uh, broadly speaking around the globe, moves from south to north, right? As significant, this inversion of cause and effect places climate in the center of our architectural discourse. These design innovations occurred relative to how a modern design style and building practice could be effective in producing a climatically adaptive, regionally engaged structure. As we will, uh, uh, we'll also see how some of these terms of modernity of, and modernization of climate and construction were expressed more often than not through the facade. Uh, so we could, were we so inclined, draw this significance of climatic adaptation back to, uh, to more or less the heart of the matter, if you will. The interwar work of Le Corbusier viewed according to this premise of climatic adaptability. This project in Barcelona, considered by Le Corbusier to be an experiment in the warmer Mediterranean climate, right, a relative south to his Swiss north. This building was proposed as a response to the basic premise he explored, uh, in his concern around the innovations uh, presented uh, more generally by the domino drawing, the openness of the facade in particular, right? Uh, the ways in which this open facade was filled with glass and quite directly in Le Corbusier's uh, writings in the 1930s, that this all glass facade soon led to the problem of overheating. Indeed, uh, in discussing this capacity in 1928, uh, Le Corbusier famously wrote uh, that he feared that, quote, the hour of doom was coming for this all glass wall uh, once he realized that it was not appropriate out of a very limited climatic condition, right? So the kind of basic premise here is that these kind of foundational aspects of the emergence of modern architecture, however schematically articulated, uh, were challenged by some of its, some of these more uh, uh, climatic, some of these different climatic regions. Uh, this challenge, however, was quite quickly resolved by the addition of brisole or sun-breaking devices, as in his project for Algiers on the right, and as we've already seen in Rio, to modulate solar radiation and keep the interior comfortable. In uh, back to the Barcelona example, uh, in this case, banks of operable shading louvers on these compact townhouses, as we can see both in this model and illustrated in section, um, suggests a different kind of originary moment, right? By indicating the different possible positions for these louvers able to be moved according to seasonal and diurnal solar patterns, this becomes a kind of graphic expression of a dynamic facade treatment, in effect derived from these experiments in Brazil that we've begun to trace. Uh, and I'm not playing this out today, but we can just say that this kind of notion here, this graphic rendering, right, is, uh, I wanna uh, suggest, one of the places where modernism becomes visible, where the international style was able to be globalized, so to speak, for better or worse. I also won't play out at great length today how Bergdahl's inverted causal arrow might help us to understand how in Le Corbusier's self-promotion of his use of the Brice Soleil, uh, here in this article published right after the end of World War II, 
Uh, he was in fact communicating and popularizing the lessons he learned, the lessons he learned from his 1930 trip to South America. Uh, we'll also have to skip around a bit the fraught debate about his role in one of the best known of these buildings, the Ministry of Education and Health, that we'll look at uh, for other purposes in a moment. I want to instead focus on the dynamism of these practices in the so-called periphery of modern architecture and focus instead then on how shading devices help to shepherd in, in Brazil, a new way of designing with attention to climate patterns. Uh, I just wanna sort of pause for uh, what I hope won't be too complicated of a, of a kind of aside uh, to indicate uh, in a, in a, in a um, set of analyses done by a colleague of mine at the University of Pennsylvania, a specialist in management science, he asked himself the question of sort of why does everyone talk about Le Corbusier and not other modern architects, what he referred to as the mutual halo effect, right? That one person kind of emerges as the star of the show, when obviously we all know that there were lots of other people involved, not only people in the office, but other architects, other uh, influencers at the time. So he tried to map out these conditions of influence to understand those interrelations. And I won't go into it in any detail whatsoever, except to point out that the kind of person that uh, is indicated as second most influential in this period from uh, the late uh, 1890 to 1940 is Gregory Wartovchik, right? A name that might be familiar to a number of you, uh, given uh, relative familiarity in the Portuguese context with the history of Brazilian modernism. Uh, Wartovchik, of course, built what is often referred to as the first modern house in Brazil, the Santa Cruz house in Sao Paulo, uh, but a name not known to many, right? I mean, Wartovchik is not as much of a a standard name in our histories as Corb or Mies or Gropius, et cetera, right? So this kind of sense that the centrality of Brazil in its moment was something that was acknowledged by these networks and connections, even though our histories have, have sort of moved elsewhere. Okay, but let's return to, return to that history, return to that story. Um, uh, and the details of the siding and the facade treatment uh, of the IRB, uh, again, our insurance building that we're focusing on, which were informed by a related effort towards a scientific understanding of the Brazilian territory that included its climate, right? So uh, this uh, are some images from the new National Institute of Technology that operated a number of laboratories, I should say new in the 1930s is what I mean to indicate, right? That operated a number of laboratories to examine climate patterns and consider their effects on the population. Buildings in this sense were an essential medium, right? One of the primary means through which emergent scientific knowledge in the natural sciences was seen to be able to be applied, right? Intended to improve well-being. And today I'm just sort of clicking through uh, some of these images uh, to kind of give a broader sense of the story uh, to get some of this evidence on the table without too much concern for their details, but to play out an indication that when we're looking at these questions of climate histories and, and kind of reimagining some of the influences on modern architecture, we're interested in these broad interdisciplinary efforts, right? The emergence of an architecture, culture and practice concerned with climate was concerned with this broad range of geophysical aspects, uh, as much as we are with the kind of relative correctness or the kind of uh, contemporary viability of some of these early climatic efforts. So it's to say that this emergence, and as we're seeing here, uh, this, this influence of Brazil was wide ranging. Uh, this emergence of a certain type of climatic approach uh, played out uh, around the world in effect, right? Here, a version from the American, I'm sorry, from, uh, yeah, from the American Journal Architectural Record from around the same time. Uh, also uh, examples uh, can exist at the Royal Institute of British Architects at MIT, at the University of Sydney. Uh, we can also see some resonance of these sorts of climatic explorations in the famous, um, in, in, the, in the famous light and air diagram produced by Walter Gropius around the same time that was the subject of much discussion at the CM conference in Brussels in 1930. Just some hints really, right, at the larger histories uh, that we are beginning to trace uh, are really kind of how these experiments in Brazil resonated and interacted across uh, some of these broader contours. I'll continue to kind of play out this dynamic a bit, right? Uh, here, another version, uh, another uh, solar analysis produced by Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, continue to explore what I'm going to call uh, uh, alongside Willem Flusser, the technical image, right? A type of media, a type of representation that is infused with new data and with scientific approaches, uh, which is to say facticity, right? That is kind of providing new understanding of science, 
but that is also caught up in the ideas and desires about how this new knowledge can influence the way we live and the way we design and build. In the examples we're interested in, of course, uh, concern in particular with how architecture has engaged with knowledge of climate to offer novel spatial and environmental experiences, as here in, in the kind of elaborate method uh, developed by Victor and Alvar Olgiai, uh, later kind of characters in this story that I won't be addressing too much today. So not elaborating all of the kind of possible trajectories that start to, to pile up when we start to think about uh, climate as a kind of originary moment in architectural thinking, uh, but rather tracing the significance of some of these image production strategies uh, as they play out uh, across uh, not only the modern period, but indeed up to the present. But back once again uh, to the Instituto G. Resuguros. Um, and for, you know, just for a second to kind of play this out at, at slightly greater length, uh, given that it is a useful and early example, provides a useful early example of this question of the technical image, right? Of the image kind of informed both by data and desire. We just looked at the North facade uh, a minute ago. Here's an image of the South and East, right? So the more protected facade in the Southern hemisphere with a diagram on the right drawn by Milton Hubertu to explain the firm's thinking. We can see in the photo the general approach, alternating bands of glazing and concrete. As Milton writes, the exterior walls, right? And these kind of, we're just kind of walking through a little narrative here. So starting at the top, the exterior walls could have been all glass. And uh, Milton refers to this as quote, very modern, of course, but due to, as he continues, much sun and light in Rio, and thanks then to, quote, scientific computing done with data at the institute I was just referring to, um, uh, the science basically said it should be otherwise, right? It should be this uh, middle image, this sort of rectangular uh, opening uh, within the wall. However, architecture culture suggests otherwise. Everybody knows, Milton Hobertu continues, since Louis Sullivan, as he wrote, that a horizontal window is preferred. Uh, as he puts it, a window of full horizontal development, end quote. The results, he ends, right, this is the end of the quote. The results, as he ends, uh, come and take a look. Now, this image is on a continuum with some of those I've just clicked through. Um, uh, uh, it's less an analytic image aiming to determine the ideal design according to climatic parameters, rather a sort of post hoc justification intended for the client, for publication, for public relations, it helps to clarify, I hope, that climate, and let's just say science more generally, data at least, was being brought into design methodologies on architectural terms, right, as a means of intervening in new possible form making. Here again, the relative impact of this approach on the interior, aided by internal shades. So a few essential points are starting to accumulate, I hope, and become clear. Now, first, the importance of Brazil and other so-called peripheries in tracing the significance of climate design methods, uh, the importance of media, images made both by engineers and by architects as novel forms of communication, as technical images that negotiate emergent data with ongoing cultural aspirations. And I've also started to suggest, and we'll look at more uh, in a minute, the relevance of the specific geopolitical context from which these experiments emerge, which is to say these aren't happening everywhere. But first, just to play out for a second, the dynamism of this overall emergence, right? Uh, the many different ways that facade treatments sought to alter the experience of the interior to place the thermal interior in a different sort of relationship with the regional climate. Now, one thing that some of you may have already noticed, referencing back to Le Corbusier's Barcelona project and others, is that the shading devices at the IRB that I've just sort of obsessed with for a few minutes here were fixed rather than dynamic, right? Uh, this was a limitation that was soon overcome. The same firm uh, um, built this speculative office building, again, intended for occupation by insurance agencies, by Seguro Doras, in downtown Rio in 1949. We can see again the differently treated facades uh, here in this kind of angled view. Uh, and a few of the different systems for adjustment on the left, a wooden shade that's shown in detail here. And it's uh, the mechanism that's described here that allows it to be sort of horizontal or vertical or at an angle. Uh, also, again, these kind of space to vent out some of the heat collected. We also see this lower kind of set of wooden slats, right, to uh, operate independently. Uh, 
Uh, another version of Paolo Gilberto's speculative office building in Salvador, further north, two layers of wooden slatted screens, movable, right? Horizontal versions on a kind of interior layer, and then a fixed set of vertical screens on the exterior layer, aiming to sort of modulate and mitigate what was in this case kind of all day sun, right? And we provide some shading full time and then be able to kind of adjust the conditions um, uh, according to the passage of the sun over the day. Um, uh, then back in Rio, uh, another image, another building uh, by the Gilbertus, a large speculative office block that relied on this straightforward light metal shading system, easily manipulable, right? And this kind of movement uh, of the screen, uh, of the shading screen uh, uh, being quite clearly exposed here on the right. And then finally, in, in one of the last of their projects that we'll examine today, um, a relatively small residential building uh, on the then in development Copacabana Beach, uh, built for their own occupation, uh, clarifies some of these elaborations, right? Kind of brings this all into one image in effect, one technical image that helps us to recognize and understand the role of architecture, right? As a device for climatic adaptability. Uh, this section demonstrating, right, the, the facade conditions of, of this building here, and here we're seeing a sort of interior view. Uh, we can sort of imagine the choreography at play, right? I mean, that you might wake up in the morning and open out the sash to bring in some fresh air, that you'll be happily protected from the sun in its kind of hottest points at noon, or you could adjust the blind if it's not too hot, certainly can allow the screen to go down in the evening if it's if it's pointing in or if it's less uh, less radiative one can keep that open so you kind of begin to imagine the sort of dance or occupation or preoccupation with a kind of thermal practice that emerges uh, as part of the careful design of this dynamic facade so there are many many others either fixed or dynamic shades in brazil and elsewhere built and unbuilt and uh, the first half of the book that i'm uh, drawing from today uh, I spend some time tracing the proliferation of shaded modernism across the globe. Uh, again, uh, the globalization of the international style from the 1940s to the 1960s, both to explore these different examples to sort of collect a kind of set of typologies, right, and consider their context, each not only with its own set of design drivers, uh, but also evident of different kinds and different aspects of climate knowledge. I mean, here, even in Sweden, of course, we can imagine uh, the relevance of a certain amount of seasonal shading. We acknowledge in this fashion, right, I'm sorry, both different kinds of climatic knowledge and then, of course, uh, different socio-political contexts as this unbuilt project for uh, what was uh, then the Bahrain uh, Petroleum Company, uh, again, not built. We acknowledge in this fashion the richness of this archive and the different ways it inflects the broader histories we already know, right, not only of architecture and modernism, but we could say of sort of history more generally, right? Of, of a sort of uh, sense of the discussions, the directions and possible trajectories that the world has taken by virtue of the proliferation of fossil fuels of a sort of world that interacted with, but in effect uh, came some time after uh, uh, these uh, quite delicate experiences in shading dynamics. Okay, so one more building before uh, kind of uh, working towards some concluding thoughts and some kind of more uh, kind of resonant thoughts around how this material sort of plays out. Uh, likely one of the more famous examples of Brazilian shaded modernism, again, I assume known to everyone here, the Ministerio da Educação Saúde. Uh, I assume, uh, again, part of your uh, histories that you're familiar with, designed by Lucio Costa with the young Oscar Niemeyer and a large team, in fact, of, of architects and engineers. The sun exposed facade that we see here contains this egg crate system, each module filled with a bank of three or four adjustable louvers. Uh, we can see then now on the top left, uh, that kind of louver system itself broken when I visited in 2015, but I'm told it's since, uh, since repaired. As well as on the very bottom left, Costa's well-known technical image, right? Showing how the louver adjustments managed daylight and to a lesser extent, passive radiation right throughout the day while still allowing for a view out. Okay, so I wanna use this building again to make a few uh, maybe slightly ridiculous claims without uh, adequate evidence that is a uh, building off of the IRB and the sort of broad question of capital flows and roles of economic development. And I'll just try to frame it this way for a moment, right? The facade treatment of the ministry building here was not only about shading per se, 
which is to say the direct daylighting and thermal effects on the interior, but also about a certain presentation of modernity, right? A facade in the sense of being the face, of being the thing, the representation, the thing that one sees. A government building that sought to demonstrate for all to see the pro progressive economic and social principles of Vargas's Estado Novo. It was both symbolic and material, as with the insurance buildings and speculative office buildings we have seen, in which the facade allowed for an interior space focused on the flow of capital, the, fa the facade here aims to reflect a novel form of governance, right? It was to be read as modern. And in this sense, also a sort of mask, right? A facade in the sense of deception, or at least a partial one, aiming to parade an enlightened modernity for a political regime that was increasingly centra centralized and authoritarian. Education and health were activities organized in the building's interior, principles of this seemingly benevolent approach uh, towards the widely dispersed Brazilian population. Uh, the ministry itself was more of something of an alibi for the exploitative labor practices and resource extraction regimes justified by the Vargas government in the name of modernization. A far too familiar story. So, you know, from this, we can begin to trace the expansions and elaborations of the shaded facade of climatic modernity in ways that are a bit more attentive to the political, economic, and social nuance, uh, allowing us to read these and other examples as a sort of shading device that facilitated what we could think of as neo or endo-colonial interventionism, right? Here, the headquarters for British Petroleum with banks of movable louvers designed by Fry, Drew, Drake, and Lasden opened on November 1st, 1960, exactly the day that Nigeria declared independence from the United Kingdom, right? So this kind of too obvious, too convenient sort of handoff, right, of colonial to corporate power facilitated by the capacity of a shaded system to allow for a certain type of built intervention. Um, we could also obsess a bit about this building um, uh, being uh, building for an energy corporation that's using an energy saving facade system, right? Again, another question of this sort of deceptions at stake in these various forms of climatic modernism. Uh, another for, sort of version of that, one of my favorite uh, uh, buildings for an oil uh, headquarters, right? The uh, Sergi Petrobras. In, also in Rio, of course, uh, built in, in the late 1960s by uh, Roberto Gandolfi and, and his colleagues. Uh, if you know the recent history of Brazil, as I assume many of you do, not only was this building sort of emergent in the context of a massive elaboration of the Brazilian resource extraction policies relative to the exploitation of oil reserves on the Campos shelf, uh, but it's also kind of what goes on on the interior of this building has been the subject of much speculation relative to the sort of uh, uh, I won't call them conspiracy theories, but uh, tales and, and the woes of, of corruption that have in effect uh, been effective, been, that have in effect transformed the Brazilian government over the last decade or so. Speaking, however, of conspiracy theories and considering their relative truth value, we can also look to the facades and interior dispositions of a number of US embassy building projects in the Middle East and Africa in particular, that deployed shading systems uh, in order to both reflect the patterns and habits of the cultures in which they were built, right? The kind of uh, cultural diplomacy in terms of the, the, the kind of uh, patterns and organizations, uh, while also mitigating at least in part the extremes of the climatic effects on the interior uh, and also hiding in ways that are in fact well-documented the clandestine political machinations going on inside uh, which is to say, you know, as much as it kind of might sound like conspiracy theory, many of these facades were built in fact to sort of mask or cover or at least wrap around uh, the emergence of the Central Intelligence Agency and the various forms of manipulations that the American government came quite to be quite known for in Africa and the Middle East across this decade. So this theory of architecture as a device for climatic adaptability then is also a theory of climatic design as a method for post and neo-colonial interventionism. The deployment of an assembly of materials and technologies that facilitated the comfort, or at least the appearance of it, of Western and Northern agents enter in, entering into contested spaces. So to, to continue then and to kind of uh, imagine some of the possible consequences and think about a few possible conclusions, 
uh, somewhat shifting the discussion back uh, to Brazil or kind of taking it back around while also kind of letting it spin out, if you'll forgive me. Uh, but in return as well to my narrative around the sort of porosity of the discipline and its history, right? So return briefly to the comments from Bergdahl that I mentioned quite early on, his suggestion that these Brazilian experiments were not reflections again of European models, but rather previsions, as he put it, of a modernization to come. And here we can see in these uh, kind of next, you know, these kind of history images, these before and after images, uh, ways in which this modernization arrived, right? And the dissemination, uh, uh, not so much in the dissemination of climate design strategies around the world, although albeit briefly as we saw, but in the elaboration of a certain type of mechanical conditioning technique, right? So uh, this building that we looked at a few minutes ago with this kind of very simple set of Uber systems to allow for some amount of, of seasonal and diurnal shading. Here we see that facade has been completely stripped off and replaced with these um, uh, in-window air conditioning units. In this case as well, and I, I belabored for a moment the dynamism of the facade options at this building. Here we see that the kind of structure of it was maintained, right? This same sort of uh, extended uh, platform exists, but it's now used to support um, air conditioners and cooling systems rather than support those uh, shading devices. So the moderniz modernization that came then was not that of one of climatic dynamism, of, uh, again, precisely of architecture as a device for climatic adaptability. Instead, uh, across the 80s and 90s, many of these buildings had their delicate shading devices removed, replaced with these inelegant and carbon costly in-window units. A, a certain type, a kind of specific type of carbon modernity, here's the version in, in Lagos, again, just completely stripped of its shading system. Uh, the type of a specific form of carbon modernity, that, carbon modernity that we are now pushing against, right? So we conclude then with the sort of battles over and the kind of interrogations of the question of comfort, which is to say, what is at stake in these facade manipulations and air conditioning systems? The relative capacity of the building, its facade to modulate the experience of the interior as a space to trace the emergence or the imposition alongside these flows of capital, right, to kind of map and produce a certain kind of normative space. So we begin to see that part of what was at stake in this kind of question of modernization was the sort of rationalization towards a certain type of normative condition of the thermal interior. Uh, buildings provide comfort in this important sense as designed objects. They are frameworks for managing heating and cooling systems, infrastructures, again, for the provision of comfort and also perhaps mediums for its transformation, right? If air conditioning, as Peter Sloterdijk has proposed, and I quote, is the space political issue of the era, end quote, then architecture is an important site for that political contestation. All the debates and polemics of modernism and postmodernism, contemporary positions on parametricism and object ontologies, all of these rest on a sort of plinth, right? Supported by fossil fueled air conditioning systems. So the question to end with, right, what does this focus on climate do to the history of architecture? What sort of themes and ideas emerge? What sort of challenges are presented? Uh, I've, I've talked about a few, but I want to sort of consolidate them into three kind of main themes. I've talked about media. I've talked about the integration of technology, uh, but I want to kind of expand out then to, to some sort of larger, uh, larger issues, if you will. The first is simply that uh, one of the kind of impacts of this climatic focus is that different historical themes begin to emerge. In particular, we get a sense of how architecture and its modernization has not only been an essential aspect of colonization and post-colonial continuities, but that air conditioning and the kind of consolidation of a certain type of normative interior has been an essential aspect of that, whether as the arm of the state, the function of capital, or here in the name of a sort of, uh, you know, internationalism at the UN, a set of narratives. So we know, right, that architecture, that modern architecture has been deeply enmeshed in narratives of colonization and its aftermath. Uh, and yet we still often, still too often look at colonial and endo, endo colonial interventions and celebrate them for their formal excess rather than read their oppressive veneers. So uh, this kind of adjusted historical theme uh, that I'm trying to propose here that helps us to understand the complications 
of, of uh, the political and, and economic ramifications of colonialism and post-colonialism focuses, focuses us a bit on the user experience, right? What is the history of how a building has been used? And of course, part of what I'm suggesting, albeit perhaps too implicitly, is how does this form of, of occupation, this one we're looking at here, uh, uh, sort of relate to the ramify, resonate across these systems of domination, which is to say, as this young woman in the mid fifties is adjusting the thermostat on the air conditioning unit at the United Nations headquarters, how does that draw on a specific set of global uh, uh, policies relative to extractive uh, resource extraction, to labor exploitation, and to a kind of economic system intended to support uh, some above the others. How does turning the knob of uh, air conditioning in effect, uh, sort of this click and hum that emerges, right, resonate across the violence of the 20th century? We could say something similar if I've, you know, if I've, uh, suggested that the kind of complexity of air conditioning and colonialism is one important theme. Uh, we could say something similar about capital and finance, the extent to which architecture has been a sort of decorative aspect of the, trans of the intensification of capital. And we already saw this with the pencil towers at the beginning. Indeed, we can trace the elaboration of the skyscraper on these very general terms as first a sort of capture of land investment which is to say it's, it's repetition on multiple floors, then a, a kind of an intensification of financial investment, the, the building as asset. And then today still lingering a certain kind of energy investment, right? The, the skyscraper as the sort of intensification of energy use via architectural methods and obfuscations. So those are the two kind of huge themes, right? And I'll get to the third, but those two kind of large scale themes that suggest that kind of rereading architecture according to its relationships to colonialism and capitalism uh, forces a kind of acknowledgement of climate and air conditioning and the role that they have played in intensifying both of those aspects. A third theme and, and, and explicitly <laughs> attempting to be a little bit more optimistic, right? The third theme is that of, of let's call it temporality, right? The buildings change. Right, the people change. And as much as architecture has conditioned spaces, right, has normalized interiors, as in the images we just saw, it has also conditioned individuals. One of the consequences of the architecture of carbon modernity is its relentless people conditioning as much as its air conditioning, right? We have acclimated ourselves to the carbon-fueled environments of the planetary interior. Other interiors, other planets are also possible. And even as we cringe perhaps at seeing shading devices removed and replaced with air conditioning units, we can also see that as much as the world has changed and adapted to air conditioning, so can it change back, right? Though certainly not without cost, not without effort and not without significant discomfort, right? But this broader sense of change and process is worth emphasizing that the world we live in today is not the only one that is possible. And by seeing buildings as energetic systems, we might open up some new avenues or forms of agency relative to those transformations. Indeed, the past that we've been reviewing, the narrative that I've been telling is a past that focuses on the future, a future after, hydro, after hydrocarbons, a future after uh, air conditioning, a future perhaps to some extent after comfort, uh, facilitated less by the technologies of energy efficiency and more by the cultural elaborations of new ways to live and work together. And this in the end might be the most important point. However simple it might end up seeming, this need for collaboration, right? For an architect approach to architecture uh, that is an approach of relationality more than objects or autonomies, for how the design of the building how could, sorry, the design of the building be anything but an engine for exploring relations pragmatically at the scholarly level as a collaborative approach interested in, as I've hoped to kind of describe and model a little bit today, a collaborative process between engineers, physiologists, anthropologists, uh, certainly architects uh, and designers, a role for architecture history then in the face of the climate emergency that recognize, recognizes that one of the strongest potentials coming out of any emergency or catastrophe is its potential to bring people together, to generate solidarity, and to cultivate collective will for substantive transformative change. 
So I'll end my comments there and I'll look forward to any questions or thoughts or clarifications of this uh, narrative I've attempted to describe for you. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, perhaps you can stop uh, sharing yeah. and, uh, and connect the cameras, please, if possible. Um, thank you. Um, Desculpem, tinha, tinha o áudio desligado. Eu estava, estava a dizer que quem estiver no, no YouTube e quiser colocar alguma questão deve fazer, deve entrar pelo Zoom. E antes tinha agradecido também ao Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Elisio, convém dizer que o link para entrar no Zoom está na mesma notícia na, a partir do cigarro. Do, do cigarro, sim. Eu acho que as pessoas estão. Obrigado. Obrigado. Não sei se alguém quer colocar alguma questão. O Adrian. Uh, well, thank you very much for the uh, for the interesting um, lecture. I must say that Professor Rogamos told me about this lecture a while ago and told me about the book that I uh, read with a. Uh, Adrian, Adrian, uh, we have some problem with your sound. Some, my echo, sound. some echo. Echo. Um, okay. What about, what about now? It's better. Yeah, a little bit better. Uh, I'll try my best. Um, so I have two questions. Um, first is, uh, what kind of strategies would you recommend to, to learn from the past? Because we have seen multiple, um, multiple. Uh, architecture objects or uh, buildings uh, with multiple solutions. And I mean, I must say that one of them, one of them that I, I try to implement in my work is uh, learning and verifying the life cycle assessment of the building and computer simulation, but I might be um, excluding some. Uh, maybe you have some hints and some ideas on that topic. Uh, and the second observation uh, that you were uh, that you were finishing the, the lecture, you were talking about uh, discomfort, um, and I'm quite interested about that topic too, because in Portugal most of the houses are discomfortable, especially in the winter time. Um, the, the temperature, the humidity, are making the houses very hard to to live. And the topic of adaptive comfort is rising and um, it is being uh, talked more and more. So could you, could you tell us more about this uh, place for this comfort? Thank you. Fabulous, yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those questions. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll use them to, to say a few things. And I, I think, um, You know, I think that what I'm what I'm trying to suggest or, or sort of begin to articulate or at least kind of provide the foundation for um, is a means to consider, you know, this term that I used a few times of architecture as a device for climatic adaptability, right? The, the buildings kind of change and are reconstructed and retrofit and reimagined over time. And that what that suggests is that, um, you know, they can come to serve our hydrocarbon demise, the kind of decline of hydrocarbons, right, as much as they served the rise of hydrocarbons, right? So this is part of what, you know, just to kind of begin to reimagine the kind of design and building apparatus as one that's focused on, uh, um, you know, sort of metabolic adjustment, right, to these broader uh, global and, and local energy systems, right. So I, I, I start with at that really big picture because um, I, I'm in order basically to have an excuse to not uh, provide some precise solutions, right. I mean, I think um, LCA is, a, is an amazing tool. Um, there's all sorts of uh, performance analysis systems and material conditions. Um, I think that what, uh, but, but the one sort of um, set of strategies that I think are of increasing interest, right, and, and this has sort of just been 
validated, if you will, by the Pritzker jury, right, is, is the sort of question of retrofit and reuse, right? And, and I know a strong uh, tradition of this in the, in the uh, Portuguese context as well and across Europe, in fact, but um, which is to say, uh, you know, how to work with the existing building stock and how, what are the creative opportunities that allow us to sort of approach uh, buildings as they are in the present and uh, turn them into spaces for new types of effective space, new spaces for a different kind of cultural experience, right? But also spaces that can uh, maybe kind of resonate across a different sort of uh, energetic condition, which is to say, make them more fuel efficient, right? And for sure. Um, but again, as, as Lakatan and Vassal, who I just oblique, obliquely referred to vis-a-vis -vis the Pritzker Prize, right? To, to make them fuel efficient and, and sort of more enjoyable at the same time. You know, I think that's a really important sort of model for, uh, for us to, to follow. Um, uh, the other thing, I'll, so I'll, and I'll just say two other quick things around, around this. One is that I think one of the aspects that I've tried to articulate, not so much this evening, but in some other discussions around the kind of uh, how we see this question of modernity and modernization today quite differently than, than in the past, is to recognize that one of the projects of modernization and architecture was to delegitimate uh, what we could call customary or traditional design practices, right? And of course, you know, this becomes more nuanced in the 70s and 80s and, and various forms of critical regionalism, et cetera. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we face a kind of deficit in terms of really um, understanding and going back to uh, these modes of building uh, sensitive to climate that had been occurring for centuries, right? And I'm speaking very generally, and there's very specific exceptions and caveats to that general statement um, in many places. And of course, the, the kind of, um, uh, you know, Portuguese uh, countryside house is one of those fabulous uh, exceptions to that rule, which has, has kind of managed to respect those many of those customary ways of building and living uh, for some time. Uh, but, I, but nonetheless, that there, you know, I, I have a number of call, I have a colleague at Penn, Dorita Vive, who's been experimenting with uh, different types of kind of um, uh, you know, uh, passive ventilation systems that are drawn on various strategies occurring in the in the American Southwest, but sort of using technologies to uh, facilitate their to make them stronger with very little energy input, right? To kind of, in effect, kind of reimagine uh, that historical trajectory that we've become accustomed to. That says that modernity or modernization was a set of progressive principles that sort of brought us. To you know, towards a higher uh, kind of more sophisticated technological perspective, and try to kind of you know go back and zoom out and kind of rather look at it as a more nuanced kind of textured set of uh, opportunities and, and obstacles to, in a sense, kind of finding those strategies that will be most appropriate to a given project, uh, regardless of its kind of uh, relative technological progressivism, if you will. Because I think one of the main challenges we face, and this is again at the kind of level of, of sort of, uh, I'll say disciplinary epistemology, right? I mean, the ways in which in architecture we kind of frame our prospects and our possible future, it's difficult to disrupt, and I, I hope I won't kind of make any enemies here, but it's difficult to disrupt the notion that um, you know, new buildings are often not what we need, right? And, uh, and even more so that the kind of elaborate, you know, triple glazed facades that produce the most sustainable new building is still not always what we need, right? And sometimes it is. And I'm not, again, I'm, I'm, I'm hedging to protect myself a little, but of course there's many situations where uh, that type of energy intensive carbon, you know, embodied carbon construction is appropriate for a hospital perhaps or a valued archive or et cetera, right? I mean, there's many cases, if we imagine ourselves as having a sort of carbon budget, right? Where do we wanna spend it? And maybe we spend it in schools or hospitals or state houses, other you know, valued public spaces. Uh, but generally speaking, we find ourselves kind of along a, a very familiar kind of normative trajectory um, in which even though a so-called sustainable building might emit significantly less carbon, it's embodied energy, it's maintenance, fuel, et cetera, you know, we're still um, threatening the future, right? And so I, I think trying to find a way to sort of take that a little more starkly, a little more dramatically, a little more urgently is, is one of the challenges that we face. 
Um, I want to. I, I still have to answer the discomfort question, but but I want to maybe see if there's others to group together. I don't want to only, only be able to. I, I can keep going, but I'd, I'd be happy to <laughs> to open up to another question before I, I do so. Thanks so much for that. <clears throat> So I, 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 I don't know if uh, anyone wants Excuse to bring. Me. Sorry. Um, uh, at first, thank you, Professor, for this amazing lecture. Um, I apologize for my poor English, but Please. I'd like to ask, uh, what do you think about the Kobogo style? I don't know how to say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And just a comment that I think that this all, all pandemic situation will help us a little because now we need more um, open windows and all mm, of that. Mm, mm. I live at, I was maybe at Brazil, north of Brazil and it's very, very hot. Yeah. And I had to go to some places that were just uh, air conditioned. Mm. And they were all killing us yeah. with yeah. the heat because they couldn't uh, let that on and the windows open. Right. And there were many yeah. windows that didn't open. And so I think that maybe now they will be more conscious because of these needs. And mm. mm. um, I always had a problem with Oscar Niemeyer just mm. because that he <laughs> schooled Brazilian architecture right. in time, <laughs> talking about comfort and, and energy efficient. I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Yeah. And I think that a great example that we have at Brazil is João Figueiredo Lima Lele, that he mm. has amazing. Mm. places and it's not that known around the world just as kind of sure. sure. and that's very sad but I just wanted to thank you for this lecture and ask about Kobogó if the yeah fabulous thank yeah. you so much and and I mean you know I, I I've been um I've been struck as I've been doing this research, you know, I mean, as, as I'm sure many of you have experienced in, in your own contexts, you know, once you start kind of becoming aware of shading devices or screen systems or, you know, Kobogo, for example, suddenly they're everywhere, right? And you're sort of seeing them around every corner and um, so many different ways in which these uh, customary practices of shading have been embedded into our built environment, right? And in and, and, and very dynamic and creative ways in many cases. Um, you know, so in some ways, I just kind of say, I, I find I'm, I'm, I celebrate the diversity of, of Kobogo as a system and as a kind of approach. And, um, uh, you know, Koshta's Parque Ginli is one of my, you know, uh, models that when I'm teaching uh, this material, I, we look at, you know, every kind of piece of that, not every kind, the different types of, of, screening, uh, of screening systems on that facade. And the, in effect, to discuss, to, to emphasize that these climatic approaches uh, provide opportunities for uh, creative elaboration, right? That there's not just uh, the, the, the anxieties around once you let the kind of, you know, climatic issues take over or be foregrounded, then suddenly you have no creative agency, right? I think it's one of the many ways in which that is refuted. Um, I wanna though focus on um, what I, I think if I understood correctly, and you'll forgive me, the sound was a little rough, but um, uh, what I think was your second question, which is sort of how the virus is complicating uh, these issues. And I mean, that's something I, you know, I think we could all sort of think about for, for hours probably, but um, I, it's something I'm really anxious about, right? Because um, again, even though I'm not currently in the US, I'm you know, still kind of operating in the US context where of course, uh, air conditioning is everywhere, right? I mean, in homes and build in office buildings and malls and cars and, you know, not that there's not a number of uh, important exceptions, but um, the initial, you know, response to the virus was in fact not to open the window, right? Uh, but to uh, increase the filter numbers in the, in the ventilation systems and turn them up, right? Which is to say, 
I mean, as stark as this sounds, and you'll forgive the, the kind of uh, bleakness here, but um, you know, saving lives in the present by increasing the, the fuel use through uh, ventilation and conditioning systems at risk of lives in the future, right? And, and you know, that's a diagram, that's a dynamic that plays out in many different contexts, not only in the COVID one, but uh, one that has been intensified um, uh, through these strategies. So, you know, I, I think finding a way to, well, I guess the optimistic version says that um, recognizing that, you know, opening the window or, or when possible at least, right? And uh, recognizing that there's these so-called non-mechanical strategies to manage some of these air quality issues um, could be a way that, that uh, could be a legacy of the pandemic on the architectural profession, right? Or, which is, and, and very much as a return, of course, right? I mean, it's, 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 this is the kind of before and after air conditioning thing, right? I mean, it's a, you know, we're kind of back where we used to be uh, in some ways, but of course, not at all at the same time. We have a very different set of kind of technical dyna dynamism. Um, so the optimistic version says, yes, we'll open windows, we'll think of porous facades, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll sort of uh, selective, be more selective with our conditioning and our insulating. You know, the darker version says we'll seal everything up and um, have to ventilate it at high costs and, and have the filtration in order to have some sort of certification system of viral health and that will be incredibly carbon dependent and, you know, not good for the future, basically. So maybe good, but again, better for the present, worse for the future. You know, these are familiar struggles that we face. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll see if there's others. A few more cameras have turned on. I don't know if that means the questions are coming or not. But get the chance. I do want to. I want to get back to the discomfort question too. But I thought I'd see if anyone else has. Oh, we do have a, a hand up. Is que a mamãe no ar do Gonçalo? Do Gonçalo. Boa tarde. Uh, hello, uh, Daniel. Congratulations for your work. Uh, great research. And uh, I'm talking uh, from Brazil, and okay. we are very interested in, in your research. And uh, so you you showed us uh, uh, a use of, of, of science in architecture to overcome difficulties and to to play also with the uh, composition and uh, aesthetics and uh, different uh, things that architects like and you sh mm. you showed us especially uh, the modern uh, version or, or, uh, of this positive thinking we, we could say and uh, right now uh, I'm, I'm also a teacher and uh, many of my students they are um, very looking to the parametric architecture and uh, exploring form without uh, let's say a sense so do you think this this uh, all this research you, you you bring to us it could be explored with new tools now absolutely no I, I think I think the issue is um, uh, I mean I don't know if this is your experience with your students but but the issue is how to get the students to play out that connection right to make that connection that says that the you know we now sit I mean we're all sitting in front of these machines that you know change the world every day, right? We have so much power at our fingertips, right? Um, uh, you know, I mean, my institution as well struggles with um, a cultural orientation that says that the project of architecture is the computational production of novel form, right? That the idea is to produce experiences that we haven't had before, that you know, and it's part of what I'm trying to kind of suggest is available for dismantling in terms of, you know, not only those technologies and, and how they're used, but also the kind of, um, uh, you know, the kind of masters and star systems that emerge, right? I mean, we, I've heard far too many faculty reviews, you know, uh, Suggest that student the goal of every student should be the should be should be to be the next Zaha Hadid or something of that nature, right? And and you know nothing. I mean Zaha's work is amazing. I enjoy it myself. But I think we demand something else from the world right now. And what we demand is less of an understanding of how those tools can be used 
exclusively for the production of different kinds of effective space, right, of, of new kind of spatial experience, or at least a reading through of those spatial experiences, right, with these questions of fuel efficiency, of, of, of climatic conditions, right, uh, and again, even issues of retrofit, and, and maybe I can finally get to this question of discomfort, right, which is to say that what, um, I mean, to put it somewhat, uh, I guess bluntly, but also kind of stupidly, if you will, but you know, sort of uh, how can we imagine an aesthetics um, in which the climate emergency, you know, that th th takes into account the kind of continuation of the species, right? That sort of questions of pleasure and dynamism and, and awe and these other issues that, I mean, again, you know, you open up the issue of aesthetics, you have to go a lot of places and I'm not going to completely go that direction, but um, how can we imagine a sort of experience of space and a sort of appreciation of novelty that is also embedded in these questions of, of you know, fuel efficiency and, and carbon emissions, right? Um, which is to say that we have the tools technologically, not only the computer, but the, you know, the shading devices and the dynamic facades and the robots and the AI, I mean, you know, the kind of elaboration of, of technological possibilities that architecture is... Um, infused with, you know, kind of almost overwhelmed by at times, we have the technologies we need. What we lack is the sort of, um, you know, cultural, uh, the desire in effect, as and I speak not as individuals, right, but as a kind of architecture culture. You know, I think a lot of what I've been trying to do, and it's, not, it's I have, admittedly, it's not going super well, because it's a very complex question, but how do we operate on architecture culture to insert the kind of anxieties about the climatic emergency into the foreground, right? So that, so that precisely the tools, as new tools come up and as we develop kind of new methods to, to uh, imagine possible futures and speculate whether they be in a student project or in a, uh, you know, a renovation or whatever the case might be, um, to take these questions of, 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 let's just say hydrocarbon use and, and carbon emissions into account, right? And even to, you know, and I think what's the prospect there and what I find so fascinating and where I kind of build out some hope even is that it sounds like an amazing creative opportunity, right? I mean, if you can take all the tools you're using to, you know, do all the wild things that one is doing, and I don't, I don't mean that so dismissively, forgive me, but um, if you can imagine using those tools, not only to produce kind of, you know, uh, reiterate of what is now, frankly, a familiar aesthetics, right? If we can take those tools instead to produce new kinds of space, to engage with existing buildings and transform them, you know, climatically and energetically, if, you know, we can find tools and concepts that will allow architects to sort of shift their, and students in particular, to shift their orientation on those terms, I think that could be a lot of fun and dynamic and exciting and a lot of amazing, beautiful material will emerge from it, right, and, and projects. And it brings me then, yeah, to that question of discomfort, right? Which is to say that we, um, you know, environmentalism sort of broadly considered uh, has tended to be argued as a kind of, um, you know, process of um, hardship, right? I and mean, we have to give up things, right? You have to drive less or you have to turn something down or you have to do uh, things that are uh, annoying or, or less desirable, right? And so I think, and I, what, I'm, what, what I'm trying to articulate, and admittedly, I'm not doing it well yet, and this is kind of a project in, in process, but what I've been trying to find a way to articulate is a set of concepts and, and sort of projects for the field, which suggest that some of those seemingly you know, negative aspects of a carbon neutral future could be experienced as positive. Right, and, and, that, so, and the polemic of this, or the kind of version of this, is that, is that the experience of discomfort, right? I mean, the, the, if, if we can do this well together, then the experience of discomfort could be pleasurable, right? It could, like if you're hot and sweating, you know, I, I again, I was, I've lived in Philadelphia for many years. If any of you have spent August on the East Coast in the United States, you know, it's brutal. Right, it's like 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The humidity is often also 100%. I mean, you're just like walking around in a kind of soup of you know humidity and human 
stink, frankly. I mean, it's just disgusting, right? So we run to our air conditioned interiors for, for salvation. I had a, a sort of running joke with a colleague, I guess now two summers ago, who lives in Baltimore, just as bad as Philadelphia. I was trying not to use my air conditioner in the midst of the heat wave. And he was writing back to me and saying, you know, how are you going to get any work done? Right. And I was like, I'm not, you know, I mean, like, and maybe, you know, maybe that's part of what we're sort of juggling with, right? Is that if, you know, certainly if tenured professors in Ivy League institutions, we can sacrifice, you know, two weeks of labor to save carbon, right? To save a certain amount of emissions. If I could, if I could sort of somehow transfer that carbon, you know, to a school that needs it or a hospital bed or, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, but I think that, you know, recognizing that our own discomfort, certainly those of us relative elite, you know, in the Northern uh, industrialized economies um, and, and other spaces around the world, if we can recognize that our own discomfort, uh, that we have a lot, you know, there's a zone of, there's a lot, we have a long way to go before it becomes unhealthy, right? Before it becomes really um, dysfunctional, right? And we can begin to explore that kind of region, right? By which we can emphasize the reduction of carbon emissions uh, and understanding that, you know, we might be somewhat uh, discomforted in that, in that process, right? Something like that, yeah. Any question more? No, sorry, let's go to por aqui, não sei se... Um, sim, se ninguém quiser colocar, mas já são 19 horas. Ok. I don't know, Daniel, if you want to say a last word. <laughs> I'm sorry? I don't know if, if, if you want to, to, say, to say something. I'm so curious. I'm, I am curious about, um, about when you when you when you uh, talk about job for discomfort, and as architect, I I am very curious about that about job for mm -hmm. discomfort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, an answer is job by poetics. I don't know mm -hmm. to come mm -hmm. to uh, in a in a way. Uh, create a, a compensation uh, between comfort, thermal comfort, right, right, and um, and quality of space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I like this this poetics of discomfort. That's maybe a slightly um, uh, that's a nice way of of thinking about it. And I, I've also thought about it as sort of the edge of comfort, kind of how far can we push ourselves, right? pretty far. I mean, again, you know, speaking in the coming from the kind of American context where so many of our spaces, and it's off, I know it's true in many other institutional contexts as well, so many of our spaces are conditioned to a very luxurious temperature, right, mm -hmm. to put it bluntly. Um, uh, you know, I mean, so for example, uh, Uh, I'll, I'll use Fahrenheit, you'll forgive me just because it's more familiar to me, but you know, the, 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 the suggestions of ASHRAE and other sorts of regulatory bodies mm -hmm. uh, for air conditioned systems have, have gone from 68 to 71, 68 degrees Fahrenheit to 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, yes, uh, uh, 18 to 21, 18 to okay. 21. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, over the last since kind of the mid 1980s right and and you know and there's not unreasonable studies you know that are about public health and physiology i mean they're not making this up completely right i mean this is with good reason in many cases but they also were not taking into account the carbon cost right so how do we begin to integrate some of those carbon costs right and and so um, if we begin to think about you know, what if instead of going up to 71, we stayed, you know, or sorry, to 21, let's do it this way, right? We kind of stayed down at like 15 or 16, we'd be cold. I mean, that's relatively cold, right? Um, you'd need to wear more clothes. You'd need to, you know, uh, adjust your daily behaviors. You'd need to change your way of life, yeah. right? And that's, that's the part of, that's kind of, uh, in effect, what I am excited about, right? Is that 
um, one of the ways that architects can help us collectively, you know, kind of globally think through this climate challenge is by suggesting that these sort of changes to our ways of life are not only sort of necessary and you know, valuable. And again, certainly I'm speaking really mostly about uh, industrialized economies, right? Uh, uh, So-called high income economies by the uh, World Bank, right? Um, those that can afford it, so to speak, right? Uh, that if we can see that part of architecture's project is to encourage these different types of, of lifestyle behaviors, right? Of thermal practices, as I like to think of them, uh, you know, and I think of that image at the Edificio MMI that I showed with the kind of six different ways to adjust the facade as you're going through the day and, you know, opening it at the bottom in the morning and moving it at noon, et cetera, uh, as, as a means to understand, uh, to kind of recuperate a kind of set of practices and habits that relate our daily lives to our sense of comfort, taking, and again, taking the carbon into account, right? So the sort of poetics of discomfort is, is, you know, I'm going to go with that term now for a minute, you know, is a sort of embodied poetics, right? I mean, it's one in which we are acting out the potential for a different kind of future. We are physically in our daily behaviors, right? Within a structural condition that's, um, you know, provided by, or at least kind of framed by an architectural idea, right? So, so I like this phrase thermal practices, uh, one that I've been using a bit, because I think it can both be thought of relative to what an architect is doing, you know, thinking about a design for the future, whether it's a retrofit or a building or a, you know, any sort of, uh, you know, sort of ground up or not, that one can take those kind of thermal issues into account to imagine, in fact, if not encourage, different types of ways of living in that space or working in that space, right? Maybe the building, maybe the desk has some sort of heating system so that the building doesn't have to for you know, whatever, making these things up, right? But what are the kind of practices from the design perspective that can encourage a different orientation and different sort of relationship to uh, thermal comfort? And then of course, what are the practices from the user perspective, from the occupant or you know, the, the worker or the resident um, that can enact some of those potentials, right? I mean, it draws in part out of a, there's a famous story of one of William McDonough's first buildings that was kind of celebrated as sustainable. I mean, this was, I think in 1982, uh, McDonough designed the headquarters for the Gap Clothing Company, right? In, uh, in the San Francisco Bay area. And he developed this very elaborate kind of regime of when to open and close the windows, on which side, based on solar patterns and, and other things. But then when the gap moved in, they put up their, you know, their different kind of partitions and desks and other systems in such a way that you couldn't reach those window opening levers, right? The way that it was designed to be very sensitive and flexible according to changes to the temperature and the, and the climate, um, could not be used, basically. I mean, they fixed it, right? It was changed back. But it's just a kind of example where taking the user behavior into account is essential to sort of activating that potential, that sort of carbon emission saving potential of a given project. So if we take that basic concept and say that, you know, thermal practice is both the designer and the user, right? Then what if they both kind of focus themselves on kind of, okay, how uncomfortable can you be? Right. And still, you know, get done what you need to get done, whatever that might be. And of course, that's going to be very different in a hospital room than it will be in a dorm, college dorm room or a house or a subway station or, you know, all the different sort of programs one can imagine. So, again, it's a way of kind of thinking, let's spend our carbon budget where we need it um, and you know, those needs are intensely political. I mean, this is not some simple solution. This is just, you know, endless debates and discussions, right? But spend that carbon budget where it's most valued, um, uh, determine those values, right? And then in the spaces where we can kind of manage discomfort, do so. Uh, put on a, you know, down vest in the winter or walk around in a, you know, shirt sleeves, I mean, you know, there's lots of different versions of this. I mean, there was a kind of push in the Japanese context in their hot summer 
to kind of encourage working in short sleeve shirts. And there was a kind of you know, government led campaign explicitly to reduce uh, demand on, on air conditioning, right? I mean, there's different versions of sort of how can we adapt our customs and habits in relationship to the provision of certain types of design um, in order to, you know, to sort of maximize uh, carbon, hydrocarbon efficiency. I mean, the danger here though, and I just wanna make sure this is clear, is that it's not to say, you know, um, individuals are the ones responsible for solving the climate crisis, right? If only we are willing to sweat and freeze, uh, you know, seasonally considered, then, you know, the carbon crisis is under control. It's rather trying to examine this dynamic between the kind of structural conditions that emerge through the professional systems of architectural design and the, and the construction industry, and then the kind of ways in which those structural systems can play out or can be amplified or can be emphasized in specific ways uh, through the vicissitudes of use, right? Um, uh, yeah, so now I'm gonna have to think about this poetics aspect a little more carefully, but I think it's a really interesting um, way to frame it and think about it, right? Is, is how can that, how can that uncomfortable space, you know, I mean, there's a contradiction here and this is what we face as a global culture, right? How can discomfort be pleasurable, right? How can there be a poetics to, um, you know, not feeling as good as you think that you should feel, right? I mean, um, these, are, these are some of the challenges that we, and, you know, and part of this too is that we're either gonna be uncomfortable by design, quite literally, right? Because we design systems in which we reduce comfort or we're gonna be uncomfortable by default. I mean, eventually, you know, it's just gonna to get too hot. Or, I mean, you know, either we manage this now and do our best to mitigate some of these um, excesses or, you know, we know what's gonna happen. I mean, I don't like to kind of go on on the sort of, we're all gonna die sort of stuff, but um, you know, the world will overheat and the seas will rise and et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, it's not a question of, it's either, you know, it's either us or our, Children, frankly, I used to say grandchildren, but you know the science is becoming more precise, right? So it's it's either us or or our, our you know our, our teenagers as they as they come into their childbearing age and probably you know decide not to continue the race, right? I mean you know these are it gets pretty dark pretty quickly when you look at the science, and so I think how do we bring that urgency back into those those different types of of thermal practices? I think is uh, part of what I'm trying to negotiate. Okay. Thank you. Thank we, you. We have to finish. I don't know if uh, Rui want to say no, something. No, no. Obrigado a todos. Uh, tivemos uma grande audiência, apesar de cinco, quase 50 pessoas, temos aqui um, um momento com 50 pessoas a assistirem. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank I you for your time, Daniel. Thank future. you very much. You can, you can come to Porto. I hope so. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. And, really. and see and see the device to the to the sun in in our building. Yes, indeed. Yeah. With the <laughs> the what is the name? It's the the, 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 the brisolet. Brisolet, indeed. Brisolet. Yeah. Brisolet. 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 Some kind, some kind of brisolet. <laughs> Um, yes, I'd love to, absolutely. And I, I wish it could have happened this time around, uh, of course. No, in, in, in fact, it's a very efficient thermal building, our building. Yeah, yeah. It's, not, uh, it's not hot and it's not... Uh, because it's compact. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, fabulous, thank you. It was a real pleasure. Obrigado, obrigado, I hope you soon obrigado. in, in Oporto. Thank you. Okay, okay. okay. Até a próxima. Oh. We keep Obrigado a todos. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Obrigado.